Um, what I hope to do is spend just a little bit of time today talking about some ethical considerations in data science. Some of them you'll see actually overlap a bit with some of the, the talks you heard this morning um, as we talk about privacy and we talk about some other considerations and fairness. Um, so I you know, apologize in advance for that if there's a little bit of overlap. But also if there's questions along the way, feel free to ask along the way because I think it'll just be interesting if we keep things you know, a little bit more interactive if possible. So I'll talk very briefly about promises and perils of data science. I'm imagining everyone in this room probably is well aware of them. And then really spend the time talking about two main concepts. One is the notion of fairness in algorithms, which you already heard some about. And we'll sort of do a little bit of a deep dive on some of the issues, both statistical and from sort of a values perspective as to what we want. And then talk about privacy and data analytics, where we can talk about some of the, the different perspectives on data privacy. Why do we even care about privacy? Um, some approaches to it, um, some examples just sort of to be provoking about what can be inferred from your digital trails. And spend a little bit of time talking about face recognition as well, because that's perhaps one of the most intrusive forms of, of uh, intrusion on data privacy. And then a few final thoughts about sort of some operational things you can kind of think of take away uh, as data scientists in terms of trying to address some of these issues in your work. So with that said, promise and perils. Promise, clearly, you know, providing insight about a domain. I don't have to, to belabor these things. But one of the things that people often talk about in the ethical space is not if you can think about improving accuracy, not just to create a system that is efficient, but because you can create a system that is potentially more consistent than human beings. And so that's one of the things to, we always think about when we kind of think about notions of privacy. In some sense, the gold standard is not to be absolutely fair, because as I'll show you, it's not possible to be absolutely fair according to all definitions. It's how can we achieve a level of fairness that we are comfortable with relative to when we think about the kind of fairness that that a human being may be able to provide in particular context. And it turns out, sadly, we're actually not all that fair. Then we can talk about greater efficiency. And efficiency is, you know, we can think about humans are slow, they're error prone. Um, efficiency is often talked about as a value intrinsically. And oftentimes in computer science departments, the fact that we can develop algorithms that scale to billions of people or trillions of data points is itself considered an intrinsic good, right? We can write papers about the fact that an algorithm runs faster or is more scalable. Um, and when I talk to my philosopher friends, they are very quick to point out that they often view efficiency as a second order value. That efficiency in itself is not necessarily a good. Efficiency potentially just enables other kinds of things. And so when we want to think about that efficiency, we really need to think about what it's enabling. I'm just going to move this down a little bit. All right. Whoa. Not what I meant to do. So let's talk about perils. Some of the perils are we can encode existing biases that reduce fairness, right? So you've already heard a little bit about that. We'll do a bit of a deep dive. The lack of transparency and the threat to due process, right? So one of the things that also comes up when we deal about you know, issues with people is there's due process. You can challenge claims that are made. There's an appeals process. And that's one of the things that we need to think about with respect to what our models actually may represent. And when I talk about efficiency, if increased efficiency is not always a benefit. And when I say that, sometimes people say, but why? So let me give you an example, right? We have speeding laws, right? On the freeway, for example, in California, you can't go faster than 65 miles an hour. And that gets enforced through police who are error prone, inefficient, and scattered, right? That is inefficient. So why don't we just build cars that every time you go above 65 miles an hour, or these days you can detect the speed limit wherever you are, just issues you a ticket. And after it issues you enough tickets, it issues a warrant for your arrest. That's efficiency. That's probably not a society we want to live in, right? Most people would think of that as a police state. And so one of the things we need to think about is we can increase efficiency, but efficiency itself is not an intrinsic good. We always need to think about that efficiency relative to the value that we're actually trying to achieve. Okay? And then, of course, the erosion of privacy, which we'll talk more about. So let me define notation just because I'll throw up a couple equations here and there, and I just want to be clear on the notation. You know, I'm not going to belabor the process of data mining because I assume you all know it. We have a bunch of training pairs. I'm going to use vectors x to refer to the input variables. Y is going to be our output, right? We have some learning algorithm that's going to produce a classifier or a decision-making function. That decision function I'm going to refer to as dx, right? So it's going to take x as its input. It will produce some decision d. I might use s instead. If I use s, that means it is a score or a real value that is being produced. And you'll see in some of the equations, sometimes we care about the decision, sometimes we care about the score. And basically, the idea is when some new data comes in, we will put it through this decision function, and that will produce some decision that we care about.
Okay, so now that we have the nomenclature down, right, that's just the debrief tour, let's actually talk about fairness. Now one of the things that's a question of fairness is, right, you can ask kids on the playground what is fair, and five different kids will give you six different answers, because the fifth one will change their answer by the time they actually go all the way around. It turns out computer scientists do the same thing, as do philosophers. Right, so there's actually this uh, tutorial talk by Narayan in, uh, last year where he talks about 21 different notions of privacy. Interesting, all right. So I'm going to focus on a couple of the most commonly used, because some of the ones, if you really want to get to 21, there's some that you kind of go, well, is that the one I really care about or not? Right, but I'll give you some of the common ones that kind of come from the legal literature and some of the most common ones used in computing, so we can sort of begin to look at some of the trade-offs there. So in terms of legal concepts, there's a notion of a protected characteristic, right? And a char protected characteristic is some characteristic that can't be used to discriminate, right, treat individuals differently in decision-making processes in certain circumstances, right? So a simple example of that in employment decision-making, right, you can't use race, gender, or age, among other factors, there's nine, that you can't actually use this in your discrimination when you're trying to make an employment decision. But that doesn't always apply, right? So in a medical context, it may make sense to actually prescribe different treatments to different genders. And so there you can actually discriminate based on gender, okay? So it depends on the context as well, but generally there are a set of legal characteristics that across a wide swath of decision-making are protected. There's also the notion of disparate impact, which comes from the law. And the idea of disparate impact is if you have some policy or some decision-making that's being made, the policy should basically, between different groups, it, it should not distinguish between them or it should not have a different impact between them based on a protected characteristic. And here's the interesting thing. It does not require discriminatory intent. So you come up with an algorithm and you say, well, I what, didn't mean to discriminate. As a matter of fact, I was trying not to discriminate. But if the impact of that algorithm shows discrimination, then you are potentially legally liable. Okay, so just something to think about. So, what are these definitions of fairness if we actually want to formalize, right? Let's delve a little bit into the formal definition. So there's a notion of what's referred to as anti-classification, which whenever you tell a room of machine learning people anti-classification, they get all bent out of sorts because they're like, what does that mean? I, classification is the thing I do. Um, anti-classification is basically your decisions don't consider protected characteristics. Okay, so let me use XP now to refer to the set of characteristics that are protected. So if I have two individuals, X and X prime, and I were to eliminate their protected characteristics, right, age, gender, race, etc., the decision I should get for those two individuals should be the same if they are the same on other characteristics, right? It comes from a legal notion of treating similar people the same. But the idea is you shouldn't be treating people differently based on protected characteristics, i.e. you shouldn't be using the protected characteristics to begin with. Now there's issues with that, which we'll get into. Then there's the notion of classification parity, right? This is one and from the machine learning sense, we're like, oh, classification parity, computer science terms, I love it. Basically what it is, it says your classification error is equivalent across groups defined by protected characteristics. So what does that mean from a formal sense, right, if we want to write down an equation? What it basically means if we want to think about, say, parity of false positives. So you can think of parity of a bunch of different factors like accuracy or false positive rates. For false positives, it would say, you know, if this person, their true value for some decision should be false and you predicted true, right? So it's a false positive, right? You're predicting positive, but truth should be zero. If you were to know their protected characteristics, that would be the same probability as you having a false positive without their protected characteristics. So it doesn't mean you don't make false positives. All it means is you make false positives at the same rate across different groups, regardless of the protected characteristics, right? Your false positives say for white people and black people or Caucasian, African-American, whatever term you want to use, you'll actually see I'll use the term white and black and I'm just giving you a preview of that because that's actually how some of the studies have been done have used that language, so I'm gonna use that same language, okay? So that's the basic idea is you want parity across the different groups based on defining groups on protected characteristics. There's also a notion of calibration, right? What does calibration say? Calibration says the outcomes should be independent of the protected characteristics conditioned on some score, like the risk of something happening when you make a decision, right? So now instead of looking at the decision, we're actually looking at a real value that comes out of the function, which is we could think of as a risk score, right? So the particular you'll see I'll talk about in just a second is criminal recidivism. This would be the chance risk that someone will recommit a crime when they 
you know, or when they come before a judge who needs to decide whether or not they should be granted bail or not, what's the chance they're going to recommit a crime? So the notion of calibration basically says, if I were to know your score, right, the chance that I say predict positive, the chance I say, say you're high risk for criminal recidivism, the probability of that, if I were to know your protected characteristic or for any given protected characteristic, is the same basically as the distribution without the protected characteristic. Okay? Again, gets back to the legal concept of similar groups should be treated similarly, right? So if I have your risk score, that should be all I need to determine whether or not you get a positive rating or not, regardless of which protected group you're actually in. Okay? Then there's also the legal one, which is disparate impact, right? But it's a lack of disparate impact if we want it to be fair, which is the impact of a policy should not be different between two different groups. If it is different, then you get disparate impact. And we look at all these things and we say, oh, that's great. I even got some mathematics behind some of this. Why don't I just optimize over everything? Okay? And so one of the things, if we think about that, is, well, what happens in the real world? Right? So I want to give you this example of the compass algorithm, which is you can't talk about ethics and fairness and computer science these days without mentioning the compass algorithm, at least a little bit, please. Okay, so one quick question going back to the previous part. Uh -huh. Um, well, so that's the issue, right? If the score is determined using XP, what that really means is XP is included in X. So over here, you really, it's, it's, this thing is not actually independent of XP. So you want to think about XP as being a separate set of characteristics. Yeah, thanks for asking. Uh huh. Excellent point. We'll get to that in a bit. Yeah, yeah. That's because that's one of the big. Yeah. And you know what real, the real answer? I'll give you the short preview for that. That's where the lawyers get involved. Right? So there isn't a mathematical definition where I can tell you, you know what? Correlation is less than 30%, you're good. No, it's how are you comfortable talking in front of a group of lawyers who are questioning you about it? Yeah, not always a fun thing. Compass algorithm. So what is the compass algorithm? It is a black box model created by North Point Software to assess risk for recidivism, which is the chance that when someone has committed a crime, they now appear before a judge. The judge needs to determine whether or not they are risks to society or not. Should they be released, given granted bail, or should they be put in prison until they await trial? So it predicts a risk score of recidivism based on features of the individual, and race is not one of the features of the model. There's actually 137 features used in the model. It turns out if you dig into it, only seven of them are really matter for the prediction. Okay, so here's our old friend, the contingency table. There's two uh, decisions we can make here. We can either label someone high risk or low risk, and then we can actually look at, with real data, did they recidivate or not, i.e., did they create a, uh, commit another crime in the future or not. And ProPublica, which is a journalistic publication, actually was the first one to dig into this, showed that there's this issue around classification parity. Okay? So if you look between different groups of white defendants and black defendants, again, I'm using their language, right? What they actually find is the overall correct accuracy rate for the model is 61%, which is actually not that good for a binary decision, right, relative to the amount of data that's available in, in each class. Um, it's correct for white defendants 59% of the time. It's actually more correct for black defendants. Interesting. But the real issue is that the mis way the misclassifications are done are different. Right? So blacks who did not recidivate, they're labeled high risk 45% of the time, whereas whites who did not recidivate are only labeled high risk 23% of the time. So there's almost a doubling of the percentage of people who are labeled high risk, and these are people who are being denied bail. Right? That's having serious impact on their life. Right? They're potentially losing jobs, it's affecting relationships, all kinds of things. And then if you flip it around, you look at the percentage of blacks who did recidivate who were labeled low risk, it's 28%. For whites, it's 48%. So you look at that accuracy score, which is the thing we tend to measure in machine learning, and then you look at the false positive rates, they tell very different stories. And the question is, okay, so what do we do about that? So one thing people like to do is they go to right North Point and they say, what's going on? What North Point says is, oh, that's an interesting thing that you found, but we're fully calibrated across the whole range of risk scores. So if you take that definition of calibration and you actually look across risk scores, what you basically find is within the tolerance for errors, black people and white people are treated the same with respect to the risk score we give them and their chance of recidivism. So they say we actually satisfy the fairness criteria for calibration. You just don't satisfy the 
calibrate the criteria for false positive rates for classification uh, for classification parity. So what's going on? So a bunch of computer scientists see this problem and they're like, well, this is a problem we've got to deal with. Let's just take all these definitions of fairness, right? If we can find mathematical definitions, we find some convex combination of them, throw them into our deep neural network and turn the crank. Because we optimize. That's what we do. That's fun. That's what I would like to do. And then sadly, our friend John, Kle John Kleinberg and some of his friends come along and say, yeah, you know what? Sorry, thanks for playing. You actually mathematically can't simultaneously maximize all of these criteria just doesn't work, right? There, it turns out because of different kinds of data distributions in the general case, you have different kinds of maxima. And so you have to make decisions, right? You can't just say, I simultaneously maximize everything. To the point you just made, right? You can also have proxies for protected characteristics. So we have this notion of anti-classification where we don't use protected characteristics, but sets of features that are not predicted can correlate strongly with protected features. Simple example. For many people, their zip code actually correlates strongly with their race. Okay? Turns out because we've had a couple hundred years of things like redlining in this country and a whole bunch of hysteresis around race relations, zip code, which is not a protected characteristic and is generally gathered in a lot of data systems, is pretty correlated with race. Okay? It can be hard to determine which such features should be allowed. And that's the place where ultimately you get to a legal definition. There isn't a crisp line here. There's a notion of how much is in there that becomes sufficient for a proxy. And that's people, something people argue about. Okay? There's also the historical bias or disproportionality in the data. We'll talk about that. That actually is significant in the, the compass case. It's clearly reflected in our machine learning algorithms. I'll also give you a simple example, right? The fact that it's easy to ignore the minority if the minority is sufficiently small. So I can build a classifier to predict a condition that only occurs half a percent of the population and be 99.5% accurate if it always predicts no one has the condition. That's a great accuracy rate. It's terrible for this problem. Where are these percentages come from? This is HIV in the United States. Right? So I can predict a model that's 99.5% accurate at predicting whether or not someone has HIV by just saying no one does and then no one gets treated. So then there's, you are like, oh, Maron, you're really bumming me out here, right? Yeah, then there's this problem of inframarginality. What? Let's talk about inframarginality. So how does this compass problem come up, right? There's actually a statistical reason why this happens. It's the distribution of defendants across the risk categories are not equal, right? So if we look at the different risk categories and the number of defendants, right? Here's black defendants and white defendants. There's more black defendants in the data in the high risk category and fewer white defendants. So what happens with that? What happens with that is there's going to be a higher proportion of black defendants that are deemed medium or high risk because there's essentially more of them in the data. Okay? And the blacks who don't reoffend are also more likely to be classified as higher risk than those who don't reoffend because of this data disproportionality. Right? This is the notion of inframarginality. It's something between the margins that because we have these different data distributions, we can get these different false positive rates that are skewed in one direction, even though our classification rate may actually look like it's near parity. Okay? So how do we deal with this? Right? The real issue is around the distribution of what the data looks like. So let's just say, we pull out these two distributions, thanks to Seth Cor Sam Corbett Davies, who actually did a bunch of this work um, and got his PhD last year. Um, we can look at the probability of reoffending. Right? And so what we need to do, societally what we do if we want to create an algorithm is we set a threshold and we say, all right, everyone who has greater than 60% chance of reoffending is high risk and everyone else is lower risk. The problem though with that is if you look at what is the amount of probability mass above that threshold, one race is favored over another race. Right? This is how we get the disproportionate false positive rate. Right? That's what ProPublica found. So what's the alternative? The alternative says, oh, this is a problem of probability mass. What I need to do is equalize the probability mass above the threshold. How do I do that? I need to have different thresholds. How do I get different thresholds? I have to discriminate based on race. Okay, so I violate anti-classification. And someone might have an issue with that societally if we come and say, oh, yeah, you know what? You had a 55% chance of reoffending, but you're white. So we make a different decision for you than if you're black. Societally, is that something we want? Probably not. Statistically, it's nice, though, 
So this is the place where we get into the value trade-offs. It's what we want relative to what the thing we are optimizing actually means. Okay? And so there was, you know, ProPublica's article sort of has, you know, one of their follow-up articles had this, the bias in criminal risk scores is mathematically inevitable, researchers say. You can replace uh, criminal risk scores or that notion with pretty much anything, right? Anything that distributes uneven distributions across different populations, which is many things for many reasons. Okay. So something to keep in mind. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the ways we might want to try to address this. Let's talk a little bit about privacy as well. Because, you know, just talking about fairness isn't disturbing enough. We need to also think about how our privacy is also being violated. So if we think about the views of privacy, kind of the modern view of privacy, both looks at the public and the private sphere. And philosophically, there's this interesting notion of privacy that it's taken me a little time, but it kind of resonates with me, which is the notion of privacy. Why we care about it is because it's central to individual autonomy, which is not oftentimes. Sometimes people think, well, privacy is just a right in itself, and it's actually a very ill-defined right. Right? It draws from all kinds of things, some things from the Fourth Amendment, some things from other places, where people try to create a legal theory around privacy. And you know, we've done it for a couple hundred years, but there's still nebulousness in it. But the notion that individuals can determine for themselves when, how, and to what extent information about them is shared, and what is shared with and communicated to others, right? And the idea here is how would your behavior change if other people were aware of certain actions that you would otherwise want to be private, right? And if there's actions that you would take that you might not otherwise take if they were public and broadcast, that means the privacy impacts your autonomy. It impacts your decision making. And so as a value, the thing we can really think about is autonomy and privacy are highly interconnected. Okay? And this leads to all kinds of harms like loss of freedom, loss of intimacy. Right? How much we share with other people may now be restricted because we don't feel we have a right to privacy. Okay? And that certainly controls things, decision making in terms of feeling you have control over your future. So what are some perspectives? We need to balance some competing interests here, right? One is making the data available for meaningful analysis, right? As data analysts, that's what we want. We want people to provide data so we can do good things with it. We don't have ill intentions, right? But in order to do that, if we want to, for example, be able to audit Compass's algorithm for what they did, we need them to make at least the data available to us and, and Hopefully the model as well. The problem is it's proprietary. They actually make money off selling their model, so they're probably not going to give it away. And then we need to think about how we create an auditing mechanism to do that, right? Whether or not we have some particular uh, people who are authorized to look at the algorithm and then we'll never share any of the information, et cetera. Medical research and healthcare improvement, you've already heard a bit about that. I won't belabor it. Advertising, which is what the big platforms care about. But if we think about protecting individual privacy, there's this notion we just talked about, which is the respect for the individual and autonomy, right? And the freedom of speech and activity. But there's all these things around avoiding discrimination, right? Probably many of the people who do medical diagnosis or medical data analysis in the room, one of the things you know is how difficult it actually is to get data. Pretty much every data scientist I talk to who does stuff related to medical data says the same thing. They say the difficult thing for us is actually being able to get the data. There's so much data out there. If we could just get it in a reasonable form, I'll put that as a parenthetical because I understand all the issues around being able to actually get the data in a reasonable form. There's so much more we can do. Right? And I understand that. I feel their pain. And at the same time, it's, well, where do you draw that line? For? And then we have all these you know, four and five letter acronyms like FERPA and HIPAA and GDPR in Europe, which has a very different notion of privacy than the United States. Right? We have the notion of inform and consent. I have this you know, 46 page EULA that you will never read. And at the bottom, you click OK and consent. And now I can just snarf up all the data I want. That's the US model, which is very different than what Europe just passed with GDPR, which gives individuals much more control over their own data. And that gets into a societal question, right? What is even the right value around privacy if we try to think about this as a global enterprise as opposed to an individual enterprise? And then preventing access from adversaries. So let me give you an example. One of the things oftentimes that gets brought up is, hey, let's anonymize the data. That's great. So there's me and there's someone else. Let's say you know, we have some information about where we came from, date of birth, and then maybe some whether or not we have some medical condition or not. And someone looks at that and says, oh, but you know, there's this really identifying information, the name and social security number. Well, we'll, we'll drop those. And I say, yeah, that's great. Um, there's also these protected characteristics like gender and age. So why don't we also drop gender and uh, date of birth? Okay. All right. And just that's actually true date of birth. Today is my birthday. All right. So just to be safe, thank you. 
I didn't work that in just for this talk. It just worked out that way. Someone could say, is that private? Okay, so I just drop name, social security number, age, birthday, and so all that's left is you know, some of the high level details. I'm like, that's great. I'm gonna take that row for me, okay, and drop it into Google. Just that row. Here's what I get. Hey, I'm number one. That's kind of cool, sort of, until you realize that you're one web search away from having your privacy violated, right? Even though we were trying to be mindful and trying to remove protected characteristics and the other personally identifying information, turns out we are much more personally identifiable than most people think. So let me give you an example, right? This is kind of one of the famous ones that gets used in data privacy. Uh, Massachusetts Group Insurance Commission released anonymized data of state employees' hospital visits, 135,000 medical records, because they're trying to make data available for people to do interesting things with, right? They don't have ill intentions. And William Weld, who was the governor of Massachusetts at the time, assured the public that he would protect patient privacy. This comes from Paul Ohm, okay? Enter Latanya Sweeney, wonderful woman now professor at Harvard. She was a graduate student at the time, so you can do this too, right? She knew Weld lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which was not that hard given he was governor of Massachusetts, right? And for $20, she, bought, she went and bought the Cambridge voter list, which contains people's names, address, including their zip code, birthday, and gender of 54,805 voters in the city. She joined that data with the GIC data, de-anonymizing it and re-identifying Weld. How could she do that? Because it turns out there's only six people in Cambridge that share Weld's birthday. Only three of those six were men, and only one lived in his zip code. So what did she do? She sent him his health records. Boom. Okay. That's how easy it was for her to take this thing that was supposed to be guaranteed to be anonymized and understand that there are other sources of data, and it's actually possible to join this data pretty easily and de-anonymize data. Okay. So she actually goes on to show that 87% of all Americans can be uniquely determined basically by three pieces of information, zip code, birthday, and sex. Okay? And if you think about that, that sort of seems shocking, but you sort of do the combinatorics and it's not shocking at all. Because there's about 42,000 zip codes, there's about 365 birthdays per year over 80 years, sort of average lifespan. Right? And most individuals identify as one of two sexes. So if we just use those two to keep the math simple and we multiply all those things together, we get 2.5 billion. The population of the United States is only about 330 million, right? So almost an order of 10 to 1 in terms of the combinatorial possibilities relative to the population. She even put up a website. You can do this yourself. So you go to the website, you enter your, uh, uh, your zip code, your uh, gender, and your birthday, and she tells you how identifiable you are. And I'm uniquely identifiable by those three characteristics. So go and try it out for yourself. It's not that hard. Now, you know, if you have a college address, it might be a little tougher because I think this data is a little bit dated. So if you've moved recently, it may not actually work. But she gives you the same thing, like who's in your same age range, who's in your birth year, who's with the same birth date in that zip code, right? So the data is out there, even when we try to have good intentions. And the sad part, please. It's just that the cell that they're in, their particular combination of zip code, uh, gender, and uh, birthday are shared by more than one person, right? So for example, if you're a twin and you're living at home, that's probably likely the case for you. So even if you're not uniquely identifiable, you could still narrow it down to a very small group. Yeah, so even for those 13% who are like, we're special, it's like, yeah, not so much. We get you down to a group of two or three. Um, and people get fired for it, so just the precautionary tale. I only say this because I actually knew some of the people involved. They were well-intentioned people, but some of you may remember when AOL released anonymized logs of search queries, right, in 2006. And the reason why I remember this well is I was working at Google at the time, and we wanted to help researchers by releasing data. And this happened, and we weren't releasing any data, okay? <laughs> So what was the idea? They released 20 million searches for 650,000 users tagged only by anonymous IDs, right? Just the string for their web searches, okay? New York Times comes along, de-anonymizes several of the individuals in the data, including user 4417749, who is Thelma Arnold, a 62-year-old widow from Lilburn, Georgia. How did they find her? Because these are what her queries included, right? 
And evidently she has a dog that urinates on everything. That's too bad. There's the dog. Hopefully it's not urinating in that picture. Um, but as a result of this, the, chief, the CTO of AOL resigns. The head of research is fired. And the researcher who released these logs is also fired. Very well-intentioned people who were trying to contribute to the research community because they were part of the research community didn't quite realize the fact that the data they were putting out could be a violation of privacy. Now, that's not to throw like a wet blanket on everyone and be like, oh, forget it, we can't do anything. It's to just get an understanding of what some of the issues actually are when we want to think about the trade-offs around being able to snarf a bunch of data because it's cool to be able to do the analysis and what that actually means for individual privacy and liberty. Okay, so computer scientists come back along and they're like, crypto, crypto is going to solve all the problems. Maybe. So encryption, right, is just the process of encoding information so only those with authorization can access it. I won't belabor that point. Why do we encrypt? Right? There's a bunch of stuff that's encrypted, like we want to keep our data private, like on the iPhone. We want to keep, prevent eavesdropping or per, keep communication secret. So WhatsApp, if you use that, has end-to-end -end encryption over the whole thing. And the big announcement Facebook just made, and this is the thing that's creating controversy, if you saw Chris Hughes' Uh, op-ed in the New York Times yesterday. Facebook basically says we want to take WhatsApp and combine it with Messenger and Instagram and end-to-end -end encrypt everything. And we're going to combine the platforms to do it. And Hughes's point was, no, 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 that's way too monopolistic. Really, the government needs to step in now and break you up into different entities. They never should have allowed those acquisitions to begin with. But interesting to see how this one plays out. Okay? And you also want to do things like guarantee data is not altered in transport, right? So database integrity. I'm sending data to someone else. I want to make sure someone doesn't sit there, pull out the database, make a few changes, and send along its happy way. So the problem is we need to decrypt the data to do analytics on it, right? Wouldn't it be great if we had fully homomorphic crypto systems, right? That's this big research goal. And actually, Craig Gentry showed that this was possible 10 years ago in his thesis. What does that mean? That means that we have the data encrypted and we can do arbitrary mathematical operations on the encrypted data. We never need to decrypt the data. That would be awesome, wouldn't it? Problem is to actually, there was a proof of concept, it's way too slow to actually be usable in practice. It takes like 30 seconds to do a multiplication. Okay. Someday we might get there, but we're not there yet. So for the time being, what do we need to do? We need to decrypt the data. And once we decrypt that data, suddenly we're in the realm of, is this going to solve our problems? Maybe not. Because well, you know, what a lot of me and friends do when we do data analysis, what do we do? We snarf a bunch of data. We throw it on a, a disk and a bunch of flat files that are unencrypted. Because that's the easiest way to be able to like, run stats and stuff over the data. Do we know how secure that disk really is? Who has access? Yeah, these are the questions we need to think about. So let's just encrypt everything. Does that solve our concerns? Well, what actually happens when we want to apply analytics is the place where we need to think about privacy models often get violated, right? A lot of work oftentimes goes into creating a whole privacy model and authorizations in a database itself. But unless we're working directly against the database, which makes it slow to do all the row accesses, we dump out a bunch of data to some other format, we just violated the privacy model of the database. So we can think about differential privacy. You just heard a talk on that, so I won't belabor it too much. Uh, Dwork proposed this notion about 15 years ago, almost 15 years ago now. And the basic idea is you, for statistical analysis, you want to make it so that an individual can't really be identified. Right? So what are we going to do? The basic intuition is whether or not you were actually in the data or not shouldn't affect basically you, like the, what happens to you as a result, whether or not your individual record is in there, which one means we can't identify your individual record, but nothing worse should happen to you if your record is in the database than is not in the database. Okay? That's kind of the alternative intuition. We want no more harm from someone sharing their data in the database. So I won't belabor the mathematics because I think you just got the overview on the mathematics, right? But the basically idea is we're just going to inject random noise. Okay? And so when we think about injecting random noise, we want to fulfill this little inequality. And the basic idea here is that for smaller epsilon, basically smaller values of epsilon lead to more privacy. But if you think about having uh, smaller values of epsilon, right, what that basically means is the probabilities we get out may actually be less useful to us because the, the variance is going to be higher. Okay? And so another thing that's also just interesting to note about this is that if you have a probability zero event in the database before you add this additional record to it, it has to still be a probability zero event after 
do you add the record to it? Because you have this multiplicative effect, right? So that also prevents de-anonymization of a particular row by just trying to find very low probability events versus zero probability events before and after the data is added. So randomized response is actually an easy way to be for a particular setup to get differential privacy, right? So let's say I have some sensitive question. I won't ask you if you've ever done this, but if you ever cheated on an exam, you don't have to answer, right? But if I go and ask my students this, are they just going to be, oh, yeah, Marin, actually, I cheat all the time. Thanks. No, they're unlikely to tell the truth, so what do I do? I have this little, this actually comes from Werner back in the 60s. Um, I have them flip a coin secretly. And if the coin comes up heads, you answer truthfully. If the coin comes up tails, then you flip the coin again and answer based on whatever the coin says. So this gives you plausible deniability, right? Because you can say yes, but you have plausible deniability because you could say it was the coin flip that made me say yes, right? But here's the interesting thing based on that. I can still estimate the true percentage of students that cheated by getting this data, but just solving the simple equations. So I want the probability they answer yes. What's the probability they answer yes? Well, it's a half. They flipped heads the first time that they answered truthfully, which is my true rate, plus a quarter, which is they got tails the first time, and then there's a 25% chance they got heads on the second flip. And so I just solve for p, and I get a little equation in terms of what I get from this randomized data that still gives me an estimate for what's going on. Now it's just an estimate, right? But it depends on how important this particular value is. If I'm just trying to do something like estimate the cheating rate at Stanford overall or at UCSC, this might be sufficient to get a high level statistic from it. Okay? And this notion satisfies that equation for differential privacy and does so actually at a local level, which means at the individual. It's not like I'm injecting noise into the database after I gather all the data. I'm actually injecting noise into each data point. Okay? So if I think about that kind of noise injection, right, basically the simple distribution to do this with, you can do it at the database level. So rather than doing each individual, that's local, you can do it in a global perspective, which just says once I've collected all the data, which is truthful data, when someone does a query at the time they do the query, I inject the noise over whatever the result would be. And I can do that basically using a Laplace distribution. That's kind of the simplest distribution that actually satisfies the proper the equation for differential privacy. And basically, it's just a two-sided exponential distribution. Okay. So this actually gets used. You've heard about this a little bit already, right? Apple's adopted differential privacy for what they're doing, and they're doing it at a local level to try to help preserve the privacy of individual users. So when data goes from your iPhone back to Apple, there's actually some randomization injected into it. Google's also doing this, although they probably need to come up with something that has fewer letters in its acronym than six, but they call it randomized aggregatable privacy preserving ordinal response. It's basically a form of differential privacy. Okay. So this is actually getting a lot of play in industry. And the question we can ask ourselves is, is this sufficient? Right? Does this solve all of our privacy concerns to inject this randomness in the data? Right? Some people might say yes. Some people say, might say no. Where do you actually implement it? Right? Is it done at the client so it's actually done at the device or your web browser or wherever the data is coming from? Do you do it in the database so once you gather the data, you never want that uh, data, the raw data to get out, so you actually just inject into the actual rows of the database randomness? Or do you do it, does the analyst do it when they're querying the database, some randomness gets injected, or the analyst actually injects the noise at that time themselves? Right? All of these things have different privacy implications. They also have implications with what we can actually do with the data. Because if we do it with the clients and then we find something out later where it would have been really useful to have the precise data, we can't get it back. Okay. Especially for medical domains, that could be potentially important. Okay. So let's talk very briefly about what we can infer from your digital trails. Um, this is one I show my students just to get them even more disturbed because they're not already disturbed that their privacy is in being violated and they basically don't have any fairness in the world and you know, they're at the point of tears and then I'm like, no, it's going to be okay because you use Facebook, right? Um, so Kaczynski in 2013 did this analysis of just likes on Facebook. They just saw what people clicked on in terms of what they liked, right? Seems relatively innocuous, right? So they actually had people volunteer for the study. Strangely enough, 58,000 people volunteered to have them track their, all their likes. And so they also provided some demographics and psychrometrics, which is the weird, we'll talk, I'll show you the psychrometrics. That's where things get weird. There was an average of 170 likes per person, and they built a predictive model for being able to predict these various factors, some of the psychrometrics especially, based on likes. And one of the things they found, which I think is interesting, that they sort of call out in the paper is even one like for people who just clicked like once actually provide a lot of information. Okay? What do they look at? 
And some of the things they looked at were actually pretty personal, and these 58,000 people were willing to give it up. Things like, are they single in a relationship, right? Not based on the relationship status, but actually based on what they liked. Um, were their parents together at the age of 21, right? That's weird. That's very personal, too. And this is just your likes on Facebook, right? A whole bunch of things. You can tell someone's race, their drug use, drinks, alcohol, Democrat or Republican. Yeah, that one's probably pretty easy these days. Um, whether or not they're gay, lesbian, or what their gender is, right? Just based on their like behavior. So when we think about those proxies, right, gender is supposed to be predicted or protected attribute. But, and this is uh, prediction accuracy for the a dichotomous classification, but I'm at 93% for your gender based on your like history. Most people wouldn't necessarily say my like history is a protected attribute, but it's a great proxy for gender, which is a protected attribute, right? So if we think of the whole ecosystem of stuff, all the stuff becomes interrelated to each other because our notions of fairness impact our notions of privacy. And so, yeah, maybe not, okay? Some of you probably heard about this one, right? Target is actually is able to build a model to predict someone's pregnancy based on a constellation of products that when they are purchased together, someone is likely to actually be pr uh, pregnant. So they build a whole marketing campaign around this. And it turns out there was a teenage or a, a teenager whose father was wondering why she actually got this marketing material for pregnancy stuff from, Mar from Target and went to a store and to complain about that. And then they said, well, maybe you should talk to your daughter. And it turned out that's how he found out his daughter was pregnant. Right? Now, most people look at that and they say, well, that in itself is pretty bad. But the thing that actually scares me more than just the, how well they could predict whether or not someone's pregnant is once they predict that that person's pregnant and they are likely to have a child, they now can track that child for life. They know when that child's ready to go to elementary school, middle school, high school, college, car insurance, life changes, potential marriage, potentially when they have children, right? Because when you know that kid's going to be born, that creates a dot called birth, and then you have a time series. And that's just more data, right? So the implications for what this actually means in the long term are not just about the angry father. They are implications about how much data is being tracked through our entire lives. Right, from even before we're born. Recommendation systems, I just show this one for, for fun because Amazon has this like weird notion of who I am. It recommended a book on differential equations and Captain Underpants and the Sensational Saga of Sir Stinks a lot. Why? Because I have two kids. And so Amazon only has one profile for me, but it actually understands that there are stuff going on rather than just one interest in the buying behavior for this individual. Sometimes it just nails it, right? I got text mining, classification, clustering, and applications. I was like, oh my god, that's what I do. No, literally, that's what I do, right? I just hadn't bought the book from Amazon, so it didn't know that I had a copy at home, right? But it nailed its prediction. Let's wrap up with facial recognition, right? Which is perhaps one of the most intrusive forms of, uh, you know, uh, privacy invasion. There's lots of applications of this, right? So unlocking your iPhone, right? This is a big deal, right? And now we don't have some password someone can get. They can't copy our face. It turns out, yeah, they can take a picture and hold it up. That's not important. But verification for, say, unlocking your, your uh, iPhone. Fun, like tagging Facebook photos. And there's a whole bunch of others, right? Actually, I pulled this slide from class. And I said, we'll talk about this in a case study next week. So feel free to come to Stanford next week. We'll talk about it. But it's also used for surveillance. The exact same technology can be used for good or bad, right? So in China, the police use facial recognition at a concert to locate and arrest someone, a suspect in a crowd of 60,000 people. Now, when it's written that way, it sounds like they took a picture of 60,000 people and said, that dot there is the person. That's not actually how it worked. When people walk into the concert as part of scanning their ticket, they get their face scanned, right? So they get a full-on front frontal shot. So it's not as you know, crazy as it actually might otherwise be. But that person went to the concert, hoped they enjoyed the show, because when they came out, they got arrested. However, that same technology, more or less, right? It's not the exact same one the Chinese government's using, but same basic principles, is used at a Taylor Swift concert to identify stalkers that they know might actually be coming to our concert, right? So one of these things we can look at and say, yeah, it's probably a good thing to prevent a stalker from potentially coming to a concert and doing violence. And at the same time, we use the same technology to say, but that's violating someone's civil liberty. There shouldn't be an expectation that the police are surveilling you everywhere you go, right? 
So that becomes the difficulty is these things are not necessarily just technological choices. And that's probably the, one of the biggest things for me to internalize as a technologist because I got into this field and I'm like, oh, technology is going to save the day. And my friends who are philosophers and public policy people just are constantly beating me over the head that says, you know what, sometimes the best choice of algorithm is no algorithm. Right? And that's the thing we need to keep in mind. Sometimes the choices that need to be made are us as experts trying to inform policymakers and being citizens to try to have an impact in the world in terms of how the regulations get written for how this stuff gets used as opposed to feeling as though we have control over the technology. So here's Facebook's deep face algorithm. Right, It's basically just a deep learning algorithm with a couple hundred million weights trained on a bunch of images. The interesting thing is its accuracy is comparable to humans, which is around 97.35%. We're around 97.5. But we make mistakes sometimes too. Okay? Now, that's an interesting idea. Now combine it with, say, London that has 500,000 closed circuit cameras all around the city because they want to be able to monitor what's going on and also prevent things like terrorism or be able to follow up on crime. You take this and combine it with the previous slide, does that become a surveillance state and potentially a police state? And what do we as computer scientists do? Because we've potentially enabled this, right? But we're more than computer scientists, we're also citizens. And that's the other role that I never want you to forget, right? Is San Francisco actually proposed that the government would ban facial recognition use in the city, right? A very different tack than was taken in London. But this is a regulatory approach but it's still an approach that can potentially solve the problem. So with that said, let me just leave you with a few final thoughts and some issues to think about in terms of when you're doing data science. There's a bunch of places where bias can come up, obviously. And so these are just some of the things to keep in mind as you do your future analyses, right? Do disparate sample sizes, this notion of inframarginality, right, actually cause bias to be introduced, not because there was historical bias in the data, but just because the kind of populations you have represented in the data are different. There could also be bias in the data, right? We've done some things in our past that we should not be proud of. We still do things we should not be proud of that get encoded in data that then go into algorithms that then the algorithms will do things we will not be proud of, right? And how do we try to define fairness, right? And so the one message I would take away from this is not that there is the one condition to optimize. What you really want to do is you want to audit the results of your algorithm. Do learning because it's useful and important and can lead to good results. But after you've done the learning, don't just measure accuracy. Look at a bunch of different factors of fairness, a bunch of different criteria across different groups based on their protected characteristics and understand are you treating people differently? That's a different mindset for how we measure advances in our algorithms as opposed to accuracy. And I say that having been, you know, guilty of spending like 20 years trying to improve classification accuracy, right? Privacy, what are the safeguards we have in place to protect the data, right? What do we just dump it to a flat file? What are we doing with it to really take steps to try to protect that data and, appro and make sure it has an appropriate usage model, right? Who we give the data to and what do we expect them to use it for? Um, is there transparency or explainability? I didn't spend a bunch of time going into this, right? But when we think about doing deep learning, how can someone potentially come along and ask for due process, right? And say, I want to challenge what the algorithm said. And there's actually, if you, you know, if you don't believe this, there are cases where algorithms have made decisions where someone has gone and challenged this decision. And basically, the answer they get back is, that's what the algorithm told me to do, right? If, that, or if we're comfortable with that as due process, then we need to rethink our notions of what we think about in terms of due process. So with that, thank you for your attention. If there's any questions, I'll take them now. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, looking at your fairness example there, the really complex example, uh, and like the caveat is that I'm largely playing devil's advocate here, uh, but I look at the problems you're raising, and they primarily come out of the fact that we have error, and the error causes us to surface the fact that we're unfairly treating people. So imagine the same example, but we have a black box. So in that particular case, what happens is, uh, is it correct to say, or is it, uh, how wrong am I to say, well, I don't care whether or not these algorithms fair anymore because it's always wrong? Well, so I think part of the questions that come up with it's always right is it's right relative to the data you have, 
right? And so it gets back to that example of it's really easy to build a model to make a prediction when the, when the two classes are very unbalanced, right? And so when the two classes are very unbalanced, if I'm building an HIV prediction model and I don't have data with people with HIV or a very small number, I look like I'm great on a bunch of metrics. But I may not actually be great on the metric I really care about, which is am I able to treat the people that potentially have this diagnosis fairly, right? Because the diagnosis itself is not a protected attribute. So it's a, we always have this notion of there's never going to be enough data, right? So we need to see is our data representative. But if we think of the data as representative, if we think we've built a model that on a bunch of criteria we're actually comfortable with, that's something where we could say, okay, let's try to deploy this data and see what happens, right? And part of it is also the measure of is this model better than what human beings could have done? So the shocking thing, right, if you look at judges' bail decisions, they're impacted thing by things like did the judge have a snack recently? Right? And, and you actually look at it, and it's really interesting because, you know, the someone probability of being denied bail has this time series that looks like this over the day, and it's correlated with basically, did the judge have breakfast and when they had lunch? Right? And you're like, is that justice? So maybe we can do better than that. And that's one of the criteria we have. And so if we're sufficiently good on the metrics, but we're better than what the judge does, then we're fine. If we're not better than what the judge is doing, then we still have work to do, even if we might look fair across the measures. Uh -huh. The security research community, many of its institutions and there is they show what can go wrong. Um, do you foresee that data scientists on an active in terms of like having positive technical solutions that they might or might not work versus you know informing the public to what can possibly go wrong? I think it's sort of a lack of imagination. Yeah, I think it's a great point. And to be honest, I'm, I'm on the technologically optimistic side, right? So um, despite the fact that this probably like made a bunch of people feel bad, right, including me when I first learned about this stuff, um, I like to believe that technology actually has a role in trying to mitigate the problem. So I don't want to just be a rock thrower and just be like, problem, 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 problem. I think we have a role to play in the solution. Part of that is understanding how we build kind of the right ben benchmarks and workbenches, right? So that when we're building a model for something, it becomes standard practice for us not to just report area under the curve or accuracy or something like that. But we actually bake in the notion of have we evaluated this for fairness? By what criteria? By what do we accept? And how does that measure against some other value we care about, right? If we can make things like that part of a technical process, then I think everyone comes away better. So that's the place I would like us to get to, but there's certainly technology is part of that solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a really good question. There actually are some people who argue, including Sharad Goel and Sam Corbett Davies, who show, made the slides for the inframarginality stuff. They actually believe you should use protected characteristics, because that's the only way you can actually guarantee fairness is if you can see the protected characteristics. Now, the flip side, though, is that the reason why they're protected is they're legally protected, right? So if I actually want to have different thresholds for white people versus black people in terms of determining whether or not they get bail or not, that potentially causes social outrage, right? So there's a reason why legally we as a society have determined these things are protected characteristics. But I'll give you an example on the flip side. So some people may have already heard of this. Amazon had a method for scoring resumes, right? And one of the things they found is even though you didn't have gender on the resume, there's a whole bunch of things that are actually highly correlated with gender. Turns out on resumes for lots of things, there's also a bunch of stuff that's highly correlated with race like whether or not you play tennis, 
right? It's not a protected attribute, but once someone kind of thinks about it, there's a long history for why that might be the case. And they tried repeatedly to try to come up with a technical solution to the problem, and they couldn't. And their ultimate solution was, we're not going to use the algorithm anymore to sort resumes, right? So they lost that efficiency, but they thought it was worth the loss in efficiency in order to gain sort of the value of more equity 